The most remarkable feature of man's future is its flexibility. It is determined by his attitudes rather than by his acts. The cornerstone on which all things are based is man's concept of himself. He acts as he does and has the experiences that he does because his concept of himself is what it is. Had he a different concept of self, he would act differently. A change of concept of self automatically alters his future, and a change in any term of his future series of experiences reciprocally alters his concept of self. Man's assumptions, which he regards as insignificant, produce effects that are considerable. Therefore, man should revise his estimate of an assumption and recognize its creative power. The future, although prepared in every detail in advance, has several outcomes. At every moment of our lives, we have before us the choice of which of several futures we will choose. There are two actual outlooks on the world possessed by everyone, a natural focus and a spiritual focus. We may differentiate them as ordinary waking consciousness governed by our senses, and a controlled imagination governed by desire. What is mental and subjective to the natural man is concrete and objective to the spiritual man. The habit of seeing only that which our senses permit renders us totally blind to what otherwise we could see. To cultivate the faculty of seeing the invisible, we should often deliberately disentangle our minds from the evidence of the senses and focus our attention on an invisible state, mentally feeling it and sensing it until it has all the distinctness of reality. Earnest, concentrated thought focused in a particular direction shuts out other sensations and causes them to disappear. We have but to concentrate on the state desired in order to see it. The habit of withdrawing attention from the region of sensation and concentrating it on the invisible develops our spiritual outlook and enables us to penetrate beyond the world of sense and to see that which is invisible. A little practice will convince us that we can, by controlling our imagination, reshape our future in harmony with our desire. Desire is the mainspring of action. No matter what we do, we follow the desire which at the moment dominates our minds. When we break a habit, our desire to break it is greater than our desire to continue in the habit. The desires which impel us to action are those that hold our attention. A desire is but an awareness of something we lack or need to make our life more enjoyable. Desires always have some personal gain in view. The greater the anticipated gain, the more intense is the desire. There is no absolutely unselfish desire. Where there is nothing to gain, there is no desire, and consequently no action. The key to progress in life and to the fulfillment of dreams lies in ready obedience to its voice. To desire a state is to have it. Man, by assuming the feeling of his wish fulfilled and then living and acting on this conviction, alters the future in harmony with his assumption. 
As soon as man assumes the feeling of his wish fulfilled, his four-dimensional self finds ways for the attainment of this end, discovers methods for its realization. The first step in changing the future is desire. That is, define your objective. Know definitely what you want. Secondly, construct an event which you believe you would encounter following the fulfillment of your desire. An event which implies fulfillment of your desire, something that will have the action of self predominant. Then, with eyelids closed and your attention focused on the action you intend to experience, in imagination, mentally feel yourself right into the proposed action. Imagining all the while that you are actually performing the action here and now. You must always participate in the imaginary action, not merely stand back and look on, but you must feel that you are actually performing the action so that the imaginary sensation is real to you. It is important always to remember that the proposed action must be one which follows the fulfillment of your desire. You must feel yourself into the action until it has all the vividness and distinctness of reality. Make elsewhere here and the future now. The future event is a reality now in a dimensionally larger world. And, oddly enough, now, in a dimensionally larger world, is equivalent to here in the ordinary three-dimensional space of everyday life. The difference between feeling yourself in action, here and now, and visualizing yourself in action as though you were on a motion picture screen, is the difference between success and failure. The difference will be appreciated if you will now visualize yourself climbing a ladder, then, with eyelids closed, imagine that a ladder is right in front of you and feel you are actually climbing it. Desire, physical immobility bordering on sleep, an imaginary action in which self feelingly predominates, here and now, are not only important factors in altering the future, but they are essential conditions in consciously projecting the spiritual self. To condense the idea which is to be the object of our meditation into a single act, and to reenact it over and over again until it has the feeling of reality. Otherwise, the attention will wander off along an associational track and hosts of associated images will be presented to our attention. In a few seconds, they will lead us hundreds of miles away from our objective in point of space, and years away in point of time. If we decide to climb a particular flight of stairs because that is the likely event to follow the realization of our desire, then we must restrict the action to climbing that particular flight of stairs. Should our attention wander off, we must bring it back to its task of climbing that flight of stairs and keep on doing so until the imaginary action has all the solidity and distinctness of reality. The idea must be maintained in the field of presentation without any sensible effort on our part. We must, with a minimum of effort, permeate the mind with the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Feed the mind with premises, that is, assertions presumed to be true, because assumptions, though unreal to the senses, if persisted in until they have the feeling of reality, will harden into facts. Man can prove the existence of a dimensionally larger world simply by focusing his attention on an invisible state and imagining that he sees and feels it. If he remains concentrated in this state, 
his present environment will pass away and he will awaken in a dimensionally larger world where the object of his contemplation will be seen as a concrete objective reality. Men believe in the reality of the external world because they do not know how to focus and condense their powers to penetrate its thin crust. To remove the veil of the senses we do not employ great effort. The objective world vanishes by turning our attention away from it. We have only to concentrate on the state desired in order to mentally see it. But to give it reality so that it will become an objective fact, we must focus attention upon the invisible state until it has the feeling of reality. When, through concentrated attention, our desire appears to possess the distinctness and feeling of reality, we have given it the right to become a visible concrete fact. At the end of your meditation, when you awake from your controlled waking dream, you feel as though you had returned from a great distance. The visible world which you had shut out returns to consciousness and by its very presence informs you that you have been self-deceived into believing that the object of your contemplation was real. But if you know that consciousness is the one and only reality, you will remain faithful to your vision and by this sustained mental attitude confirm your gift of reality and prove that you have the power to give reality to your desires that they may become visible concrete facts. Define your ideal and concentrate your attention upon the idea of identifying yourself with your ideal. Assume the feeling of being it, the feeling that would be yours were you already the embodiment of your ideal. Then live and act upon this conviction. This assumption, though denied by the senses, if persisted in, will become fact. You will know when you have succeeded in fixing the desired state in consciousness by simply looking mentally at the people you know. If you see them as you formerly saw them, you have not changed your concept of self. For all changes of concepts of self result in a changed relationship to your world. In your meditation, allow others to see you as they would see you were this new concept of self a concrete fact. You always seem to others an embodiment of the ideal you inspire. Therefore, in meditation, when you contemplate others, you must be seen by them mentally as you would be seen by them physically were your concept of self an objective fact. That is, in meditation you imagine that they see you expressing that which you desire to be. If you assume that you are what you want to be, your desire is fulfilled, and in fulfillment all longing is neutralized. You cannot continue desiring what you have already realized. Your desire is not something you labor to fulfill, it is recognizing something you already possess. It is assuming the feeling of being that which you desire to be. Believing and being are one. The conceiver and his conception are one. Therefore, that which you conceive yourself to be can never be so far off as even to be near, for nearness implies separation. Being is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. If you assume that you are what you want to be, then you will see others as they are related to your assumption. If, however, it is the good of others that you desire, then, in meditation, you must represent them to yourself as already being that which you desire them to be. It is through desire that you rise above your present sphere and the road from longing to fulfillment is shortened as you experience in imagination what you would experience in the flesh were you already the embodiment of the ideal you desire to be. A dream is nothing more than uncontrolled, 
four-dimensional thinking, or the rearrangement of both past and future sensory impressions. When we have learned to control the movements of our attention in the four-dimensional world, we shall be able to consciously create circumstances in the three-dimensional world. We learn this control through the waking dream, where our attention can be maintained without effort. For attention minus effort is indispensable to changing the future. We can, in a controlled waking dream, consciously construct an event which we desire to experience in the three-dimensional world. The sensory impressions we use to construct our waking dream are present realities displaced in time or the four-dimensional world. All that we do in constructing the waking dream is to select from the vast array of sensory impressions those which, when they are properly arranged, imply that we have realized our desire. With the dream clearly defined, we relax and induce a state of consciousness akin to sleep, a state which, although bordering on sleep, leaves us in conscious control of the movements of our attention. We experience in imagination what we would experience in reality were this waking dream an objective fact. It is important always to remember that the only thing which occupies the mind during the waking dream is the waking dream the predetermined action which implies the fulfillment of our desire. How the waking dream becomes physical fact is not our concern. Let me again lay the foundation of changing the future, which is nothing more than a controlled waking dream. 1. Define your objective. Know definitely what you want. Two, construct an event which you believe you will encounter following the fulfillment of your desire, something which will have the action of self-predominant, an event which implies the fulfillment of your desire. Three, immobilize the physical body and induce a state of consciousness akin to sleep. Then, mentally feel yourself right into the proposed action, imagining all the while that you are actually performing the action here and now, so that you experience in imagination what you would experience in the flesh were you now to realize your goal. Instead of learning my craft in schools where attending courses and seminars is considered a substitute for self-acquired knowledge, my schooling was devoted almost exclusively to the power of imagination. I sat for hours imagining myself to be other than that which my reason and my senses dictated until the imagined states were vivid as reality. Man's imagination is the man himself, and the world as imagination sees it is the real world. In meditation, when the brain grows luminous, I find my imagination endowed with the magnetic power to attract to me whatsoever I desire. Desire is the power imagination uses to fashion life about me as I fashion it within myself. First desiring and then imagining that we are experiencing that which we desire to experience, we can mold the future in harmony with our desire. In dream we are usually the servant of our vision rather than its master but the internal fantasy of dream can be turned into an external reality. In dream, as in meditation, we slip from this world into a dimensionally larger world. 
It is in this fully conscious state, when we are in control of the direction of thought, that we call things that are not seen as though they were. In this state, we call things by wishing and assuming the feeling of our wish fulfilled. Unlike the world of three dimensions, where there is an interval between our assumption and its fulfillment, in the dimensionally larger world, there is an immediate realization of our assumption. The external reality instantly mirrors our assumption. We can, by the power of imagination, mold our world in harmony with our desire. No man needs help to direct him in the application of this law of consciousness. I am is the self-definition of the Absolute, the root out of which everything grows. What is your answer to the eternal question, Who am I? Your answer determines the part you play in the world's drama. Your answer, that is, your concept of self, need not conform to the external reality to which it relates. If I do not believe that I am already that which I desire to be, then I remain as I am and die in my present concept of self. There is no power outside of the consciousness of man to resurrect and make alive that which man desires to experience. That man who is accustomed to call up at will whatever image he pleases will be, by virtue of the power of his imagination, master of his fate. It is our conception of ourselves which frees or constrains us, though it may use material agencies to achieve its purpose. Because life molds the outer world to reflect the inner arrangement of our minds, there is no way of bringing about the outer perfection we seek other than by the transformation of ourselves. There can be no outer change until there is first an inner change. As within, so without. Everything we do, unaccompanied by a change of consciousness, is but futile readjustment of surfaces. However we toil or struggle, we can receive no more than our assumptions affirm. If we would become as emotionally aroused over our ideals as we become over our dislikes, we would ascend to the plane of our ideal as easily as we now descend to the level of our hates. Love and hate have a magical transforming power, and we grow through their exercise into the likeness of what we contemplate. By intensity of hatred, we create in ourselves the character we imagine in our enemies. Qualities die for want of attention, so the unlovely states might best be rubbed out by imagining beauty for ashes and joy for mourning, rather than by direct attacks on the state from which we would be free. There is nothing to change but our concept of self. As soon as we succeed in transforming self, our world will dissolve and reshape itself in harmony with that which our change affirms. The undisciplined mind finds it difficult to assume a state which is denied by the senses. Assume that you are that which you want to be. Experience in imagination what you would experience in the flesh were you already that which you want to be. Remain faithful to your assumption so that you define yourself as that which you have assumed. Things have no life if they are severed from their roots and our consciousness, our I am-ness, is the root of all that springs in our world.
The most remarkable feature of man's future is its flexibility.